press record and let you all take it away. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Welcome and thank you very much for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I wanna start tonight's presentation uh, with the University of Maine's uh, Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. It's a real privilege to engage with indigenous heritage sites and the land acknowledgement articulates the deep and important connections between indigenous peoples of Maine and the places where we all live and work together today. And it's also an important reminder of those who cared for our homeland in the past and the relationship between past and present peoples. The University of Maine recognizes that it's located on Marsh Island in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. Penobscot homeland is connected to the other Wabanaki tribal nations, the Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq through kinship, alliances, and diplomacy. The university also recognizes that the Penobscot Nation and the other Wabanaki tribal nations are distinct, sovereign, legal, and political entities with their own powers of self-governance and self-determination. So with that as uh, the backdrop for our talk tonight, uh, Sarah and I are going to tag team our presentation. I'll begin with a general overview of archaeological shell heaps and highlight their cultural, social, and research value. And then uh, Sarah will share with you information on the Damariscotta shell mounds and current efforts to steward these important heritage spaces. The indigenous peoples of the region have uh, a 12,000 year history here. And much of the record of that history is encapsulated in uh, subsurface archaeological spaces, oral narratives, uh, and intergenerational memory and petroglyph sites. The image on the left is an artist's rendi rendition of uh, Gluskab. And Gluskab is an indigenous culture hero who's said to be responsible for the creation of people by shooting an arrow into an ash tree from which people emerged. He's also responsible for many of the geologic features we see around Maine. For example, in Penobscot Bay, a quartz vein near Castine is a result of Gluskub killing a moose and throwing the entrails across the bay. Other features such as uh, the Penobscot River and Mount Kinney are also connected to Gluskub activities. And so Gluskub helped shape the vein we see today and as such, Oral narratives like these are a source of information for understanding indigenous people's worldview and life ways. Another way that we can gain insight into uh, indigenous worldviews is through art. In the center is a photo of petroglyphs from Machias Bay. And these are images that are pecked into uh, stone outcrops. And they're also a way to convey information. Petroglyph images occur all over the state. And oftentimes you hear that there's uh, no uh, written record for native peoples prior to European contact. But in reality, uh, these uh, are records that tell stories and histories. In Machias Bay, for example, there's a petroglyph of a ship on one of the outcrops. Um, and so that tells us something about people's interactions with large sailing ships that uh, came to North America. Finally, uh, the image on the right is a picture of archaeological excavations at a site in Eddington, Maine. And places such as this also preserve indigenous pasts. <clears throat> and these are another type of narrative for understanding the lives of people here before European contact. Here in Maine, uh, we also have coastal archaeological sites, which often take the form of shell heaps. They're sometimes called uh, mounds or middens. And these are important repositories of indigenous heritage and they're fragile cultural and historic uh, spaces. Shell heaps are human generated uh, accumulations of shell where in the past people have um, people harvesting uh, shellfish would deposit the shells at locations along the coast. The image on the left is from the 19th century excavations at uh, one of the large shell heaps on the Damariscotta River. And the image on the right is another shell heap on the Damariscotta River, but as you can see, it's not quite as prominent. Uh, shell heaps are not unique to Maine. They occur all over the world in both 
uh, both coastal and riverine settings. But here in Maine, they seem to be restricted to uh, marine areas. Most Maine shell heaps uh, document roughly the last 3,000 years of indigenous lifeways. However, uh, a few date to roughly 5,000 years old, north, uh, one on North Haven, for example. Um, and also we have some that are uh, post-contact shell heaps um, and um, where uh, both indigenous and non-indigenous peoples created um, uh, shell mounds. Uh, these post-contact shell heaps uh, tend to be a little less, much less common than uh, some of the earlier ones. In Maine, people constructed shell mounds using soft shell clam or oyster shell. Uh, clam is the most common. These deposits can range from uh, less than a meter to multiple meters thick. The term midden has become a catch-all term for these spaces that by definition uh, suggests uh, garbaging behavior. And I think this is a misnomer in many cases because we know that uh, shell heaps can be very prominent and visible features on the landscape and may have been intentional landmark constructions. Uh, in my opinion, to reduce these cultural spaces to trash dump status really underappreciates uh, the full breadth of their role in indigenous lifeways. We know that shell heap sites are complex stratigraphically and often reflect uh, dynamic cultural spaces in which human activities change over time and space. It's not uncommon to find shell free layers within these sites. And um, this may be evidence of site abandonment or alternate uses of the location. And you can see an example here of a shell heap site with very very thick deposits, um, as well as one that has a simple thin layer of shell. Occasionally, archaeologists also encounter house floors, hearth features, human mortuary features, and dog burials at shell-bearing archaeological sites. There are roughly 2,000 shell heap sites present along the coast of Maine, and they vary in size and setting. On one end of the spectrum, we have the very large oyster shell heaps um, on the Damariscotta River. Um, the Glidden Midden scene here is the largest shell mound in the Northeast. And on the opposing riverbank, um, Native peoples constructed an equally large shell mound called the Whaleback Midden. And Sarah will discuss these middens in more detail later tonight. <clears throat> Other uh, shell heaps, such as the one shown here in Washington County on Sips Bay, are not so prominent. These smaller shell heaps may be remnants of once larger sites that are mostly gone now through erosion, or they may reflect short-term use of a space or use by uh, smaller numbers of families. Many, like the ones on the bottom slides, are located in exposed areas on the coast, making them particularly vulnerable to both human and natural impacts. Perhaps one of the most notable characteristics of shell heaps is their preservation of varied data sets. Because the shells act as a preservation agent by reducing the acidity in the soil, these sites contain artifacts and ecofacts generally not preserved in other types of sites. Some examples of the materials uh, that are commonly recovered from shell heaps are shown here. Organics such as plant remains, um, bone, uh, uh, either a food bone or bone tools and shell uh, can all be radiocarbon dated and can inform our reconstructions of past environments. And they can also help us determine seasonal use of the site by families, what folks relied on for food resources, and they can broaden our understandings of indigenous ideologies um, and people's relationships to other species. Cultural material recovered from shell heaps uh, include stone tools and pottery and bone tools. And these really provide a window into people's philosophies on materiality. We can examine how their material culture changed through time and space, and we can learn about their discard and recycling practices and perhaps reflect on how they differ from our own. Good preservation allows us to explore past technologies and identify areas of uh, technical, technological sophistication. And this really helps to deconstruct some of those notions of primitiveness or evolutionary inferiority, which were common archeological interpretations of uh, indigenous peoples in the past. On this slide, we have some examples of items from main sites. 
The far left is a photo of projectile points of various styles and materials. Um, and you can see how finely crafted they are. It takes some real skill to do this. On the far left uh, is a, uh, excuse me, on in the center uh, is an image of uh, indigenous ceramics. And these change through, through time, the style does, so uh, much like cars and houses. Um, and so we can, they, they serve as a good reference point for um, dating, uh, other things you might find in a shell heap. Also because of good organic preservation, we recover items such as um, shell beads, uh, which you can see in the upper right. And uh, this bird bone flute in the lower right was recovered from a site at Acadia National Park. Bone and shell do not preserve well on uh, in sites on Maine's interior. So we wouldn't have access to these uh, materials without uh, shell heaps. Shell heaps also preserve cultural features, and these are remnants of past human activity. But unlike artifacts, you can't uh, simply pick them up and take them back to the lab to analyze. On the left, we have a fire hearth, and these are um, excellent for providing charcoal for radiocarbon dating. And on the right uh, is a dark stain that is indicative of perhaps uh, a burning or uh, perhaps animal processing, um, we're unsure of what it is, but we know that um, uh, some activity, some human activity took place there. Shell heaps can contribute significantly to reconstructions of past environments, uh, food choices and seasonality. For example, they can help us understand changes in ocean temperatures by the presence or absence of certain species. The image on uh, the left, um, uh, these three images include uh, shell, uh, otoliths, which is ear bone of a fish, and we find those in, in the middens, um, and uh, swordfish rostrum, which uh, about 5,000 years ago, main waters were warm enough uh, to um, provide a good habitat for swordfish. And so that tells us a little bit um, about what the, the environment was at that time. The images on the upper right include uh, a copper nugget, possibly from a source in Nova Scotia, and a fish hook. And these tell us a bit about past travel and technologies. And the two images on the bottom are uh, cultural features. The one on the left is a, uh, it's a standing stone feature, and we're unsure of its function, but it may have served as a marker or, or of some sort. Um, and this here is another feature, and this was interpreted as a house floor. So all of these things are in important parts of um, interpreting the past through shell midden uh, research. Shell midden um, or shell mounds are some of the only places we can acquire data on extinct species, such as the sea mink and great auk, both of which were uh, hunted to extinction after European contact. And these are three sea mink uh, jaw bones, and they were found clustered together at a site in Machias Bay. Perhaps um, folks there had, had them bundled for some reason. Uh, these kinds of discoveries really help us to understand the relationships between Wabanaki peoples, um, remains indigenous peoples, and various mammal, bird, fish, and uh, reptile species. In addition to being important repositories of scientific and anthropological information, shell heaps carry really important um, heritage and social value as well. Most shell heaps in Maine record past indigenous lifeways and as such are important and uh, irreplaceable heritage resources. There are four federally recognized tribes in Maine, the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot, and collectively, uh, we are known as the Wabanaki or people of first light. Uh, although the main tribal nations have done really well to maintain many distinct cultural characteristics, connectedness to tribal histories and, uh, and practices was disrupted through efforts of assimilation, disease, acts of violence and religious conversion during the period of European contact and colonization. Although we no longer have access um, 
we well, we no longer have access to the same cultural spaces as our ancestors. Um, and so shell heap research and preservation efforts that are consistent with tribal agendas help indigenous communities maintain distinct practices and identities and um, enables us to draw from past life ways and ways that enrich our communities, educate our young people and sustain our identities. Research, preservation and documentation of shell heaps in collaboration with uh, indigenous communities is one way to confront uh, the effects of colonization on Maine's indigenous populations. Wabanaki people have long maintained their connections to shell heaps and good examples of this can be found in the 19th century writings of Joseph Nicola, who was among other things, uh, a Penobscot representative to the Maine legislature. In 1893, uh, Nicola self-published Life and Traditions of the Red Man, a book that he wrote uh, to narrate public, or excuse me, to narrate uh, Penobscot traditions for a broad audience. And he drew from his personal knowledges, uh, believing that indigenous peoples were the only ones qualified to convey information about indigenous lifeways. Among uh, Nicola's story are references to shellfish and shell heaps. Uh, for example, he shares a story where Glooscub takes a journey across the land. And um, along the way, he encounters people and animals to, to guide him in various aspects of life. And one such encounter was with uh, Mei Mei, the woodpecker. Mei Mei helps him kill a giant serpent from the ocean. And as um, a mark of friendship, Glooskab dips his arrow into the bloody ocean water uh, and touches Mei Mei's head, marking him as a friend uh, forever. And so um, after the serpent is killed, Mei Mei flies away toward the setting sun, uh, but returns frequently to um, bring Glooskab food and then one morning, uh, Glooskab wakes to the sound of a dog barking from the direction, again, of the setting sun. And Glooskab uh, calls to the animal and the dog appears uh, with meat in his mouth, which he uh, uh, places at Glooskab's feet. Appreciative of Glooskab's efforts to kill the serpent, the dog says, I have come to stay with you. I shall stay where and when you stay and I shall uh, go when and where you go. Eventually, uh, the woodpecker uh, stops bringing food to Glooskab because it was time for Glooskab to find his own food. And this is when the dog steps into his role as companion. And he takes Glooskab to the mudflats near the edge of the water and shows him um, uh, where and how to get shellfish. And so the dog is actually um, uh, the being that brought shellfish into the lives of the Wabanaki or the, or the main, main indigenous peoples. On occasion, we see reverence for the dog in archeological uh, settings, particularly ceremonial dog burials within shell mounds um, themselves. In fact, dog burials were reported during the excavations um, at the Whaleback Mound. Later in his narratives, Nicola uh, references the oyster shell heaps specifically. And in one story, he notes that uh, women uh, elders came from the south and were allowed to take oysters so long as uh, their people did not bother the elderly or the sick. And this enabled people from both the north and the south to benefit from the oysters. He writes, um, these oyster beds were so productive that it gave a supply to all that wished for the period of many times 70 years, so that the shells of this food fish was piled up almost mountain high on the shore of a riverbank for a long distance. And I think this passage is very telling in terms of indigenous philosophies about food or um, quote unquote resource sharing. Uh, the oysters were not a species to build status or wealth on, but, um, but in, at least in terms of this story, they were um, something to share. So as you can see, shell heaps are embedded in uh, not only indigenous histories, but they also serve as mnemonic devices for passing indigenous philosophies and values through intergenerational storytelling. Additionally, shell heaps are remnants of um, indigenous built heritage and architecture of sorts, similar to post-colonial structures. Um, however, um, 
indigenous histories are generally not well represented in Maine's heritage conversations. Like many indigenous peoples across the globe, Wabanaki histories and cultural spaces are marginalized and in many cases, socially uh, invisible. Preservation, research and awareness of shell heaps helps to counteract kind of that historic erasure of Maine's indigenous heritage and can support educational initiatives um, uh, designed uh, around Maine's first peoples. Unfortunately, these spaces are extremely threatened by sea level rise, irregular freeze thaw cycles, which um, destabilizes the matrix of these locations, um, increased storm intensity and looting. And uh, we at the University of Maine, along with um, volunteers and tribal partners and conservation organizations are working to monitor and build awareness around these fragile spaces before they're gone for good. So with that, I'm going to turn the Zoom session over to Sarah now, and uh, she will discuss the Dammer Scottish Shell Mound specifically and how Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust is working to build awareness around shell heaps. Excuse me, thank you so much, Bonnie. That was incredibly interesting. And I had no knowledge of the whole connection between the Gluskab um, dog and, um, and all that that was related to the shell heaps. So that was really fascinating. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned, there, there was a, a dog, at least one um, skeleton found at, at the Whaleback Midden site. So that's pretty interesting. So uh, again, as has been said, I am Sarah Gladue. I direct the Education and Citizen Science Monitoring Programs at Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. We are a land trust and education and citizen science focused organization that is based in the Pemaquid Peninsula area. So Dermascot and Newcastle down the Pemaquid Peninsula, including Bristol, South Bristol, um, Bremen a bit, that, that region of, the, of this coast. So I thought I would start by just um, talking about oysters momentarily since they are the, the uh, focus of the talk in a fashion and then um, go a little bit more into the area that I work in and share a, a little bit about what it's like to be at the Midden site along the Scott estuary and talk about those sites specifically. And then wrap up with just a little bit about the Midden Minding program that Bonnie alluded to earlier, talked about earlier today. So oysters are um, a wonderful creature that has many functions in the estuaries and they include um, uh, providing habitat for small creatures like amphipods and fish. When they build reefs, they clean the water by extracting um, many nutrients and also plankton and so forth from the waters. There are filter feeders like the other bivalves that we're familiar with here on the coast of Maine. They form these reefs and um, stabilize the, the shores a bit. So this is an image of, a, of an oyster reef. It's kind of in a mudflat area or in a, along a salt marsh area. Um, and the Dermascata is well known, not only for having had uh, these, eight, these creatures for, for since prehistoric times, but also currently we have a um, very industrious uh, group of aquaculturists who are building uh, oyster farms all along the Dermascata. So the oyster farms are um, flourishing, but in large part because the Dermascata estuary is really an excellent environment for oysters. So I'm gonna talk about that a bit, but the Damascata also has uh, clams and um, cohogs and so forth as well. So just to orient you, and I realize this is small on my screen at least, and probably on yours as well, but just to, I hope you can see my cursor. I'm um, going around in a circle here with my cursor. This is Great Salt Bay. It's an inland, relatively shallow lagoon, and um, it is fed in part, in, in small, there's a small amount um, compared to the other estuaries in that in the mid coast main area. Uh, there's a, there's a small channel of fresh water that comes out from Damascata Lake and goes into Great Salt Bay. But most of the waters are tidal, and so um, the the channel goes out under Route One. So if you go along Route One towards Wiscasset, um, traveling southward, you'll see on your right, Great Salt Bay, you'll actually see oyster growing happening 
uh, currently, as you go over there, that that Route One site is um, very close to the whale back in Glidden Min that we're going to be talking about further in a few minutes. But the channel goes out, and then we um, come into the towns of the sort of downtown area of Newcastle, Dermascada, and there's a bridge there, and then the channel opens up a bit. Um, and continues to turn and twist. And there are um, quite a few um, kind of, you know, islands along the way. And then as you get out to the open ocean, there are, there are more islands, but it's a, it's a, a very, um, of course, it's a tidal estuary. And so it's very well flushed. Um, the water from Great Salt Bay is flushed um, every 28 days or so in, in its entirety. And, um, so there's a very saline environment. The waters are 28 to 30 parts per thousand where the open ocean is 35 parts per thousand. And it's a fairly warm estuary. Uh, unlike the Sheepscot, which is nearby, which has a deep channel, this is a, not a deep channel. And there are many barrier islands that uh, help to help sort of um, retain the water and also to, to let it warm um, when the tide is out and then as the tide comes back in, that warm mud is, is warming the waters, which helps the oysters to grow. Um, and so this has been the case for, for a long time. And there are um, uh, clam and quahog, uh, mostly clam in the lower part of the river. In a number of locations it, um, throughout the estuary, there are small clam middens. And then there is, um, Right here in Great Salt Bay, there is a midden that is both clam, uh, well, it's, it's quahog and um, softshell clam here. But the other um, uh, middens throughout the Great Salt Bay area and including the Glidden and Wellback middens are oysters. So it's, just, it's kind of an interesting um, geography in that regard. So if you visit Whaleback Middens, uh, you can pull into the parking lot that is near our headquarters building across from Hammond Lumber, or you can also, there is a, um, the state historic site sign, uh, because this property, the middens themselves are owned by the state of Maine, that is all of us, uh, Department of Conservation owns the property, but uh, Coastal Rivers is, is the local manager and um, partner in, in that management. So there's a, there's a small parking lot across from Great Salt Bay School, and there is a trail that goes down the hill. Um, it is um, crushed gravel initially, and then it becomes uh, a grassy um, pathway through an old orchard, actually. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of what it's like there. Um, so you go down the hill towards the estuary. The estuary is right below you, although you can't necessarily see it at this point. And when you get down to the river, the estuary, um, you are able to look across. And even before you get to visibly see what we call whaleback midden, which is on the side of the river where you are walking in this case, um, you can look out across the estuary and see this big white shell heap uh, that we call now Glidden Midden. And this heap actually is also accessible by a trail. And um, on our website, coastalrivers.org, you can find the maps that will help you get to Glidden Midden. Um, it's an out and back walk and you actually have to go under, well, through it, you have to go under route one through a sheep tunnel, which is a big, dark, creepy looking uh, culvert, but it's, it's a good adventure. And then you can come out and at low tide is a good time to visit the site because uh, you can walk along the shore and not disturb the middens themselves, which is a really important part of, um, uh, well, of visiting any midden. They are um, prehistoric sites, they're archeological treasures. And um, as you can imagine, we want to disturb them as little as possible. So you can walk along the shore and visit the midden. Um, if you do visit this site, the tide is such, the river um, constrains so much above town the low tide is actually about an hour past what the tide chart says for high, high or low tide in, in Newcastle. So whatever it says in Newcastle, you wanna wait an hour um, before you try to get to this site. Um, so here we are looking across and to our left is um, south and to our right is north and north is where Great Salt Bay is. Um, 
And let's see, when you kind of turn and walk into the woods, there um, there's this little bit of a, a trail that goes into the woods and there's a ravine um, where a stream has really washed away some of the dirt and shell material is very exposed. There is some erosion um, at this location. There is a, um, a platform that you can look out over and into and see just how, um, I don't know, incredibly, and this is just shell heat material. There's no other, there's nothing else in it for the most part. Um, on the upper part, there's, there's certainly some soil and some roots, uh, but you can see that the shell is the vast majority of this, of this material. And as Bonnie was saying, these um, are some of the largest shell heaps on the East Coast, and they were much larger in the past. Um, so here, uh, without the vegetation, which the colonists um, had removed completely from these hills, these are, you know, the stripped away versions of these shell heaps, and you can see just how vast these, these hills are. The colonists did uh, create actually a factory on the property that is now Whaleback Middens, and they were extracting vast quantities of shell to be used as fertilizer and also um, uh, to for egg, um, well, for chicken uh, feed to strengthen the eggs of the chickens. Um, so unfortunately, the whaleback bin is is much is a fraction of its original size, but there are some historic photographs on site that you can see, and uh, from from these images, you can get a sense of what it might have looked like uh, in the past. So that factory burned in, I believe, 1893, and um, at that point, much of the of the industry was was halted. Um, there was some early excavation that was done on these sites. And in fact, Bonnie mentioned that there are some, um, there actually was a great auk skeleton found at this site and a few other tools. But as she also mentioned, um, there is some belief that perhaps these, these shell heaps had um, a great significance that was much beyond a trash heap and um, whether what, what that significant was significant what significance was um, certainly is is a really of great interest and and speculation I think at this time for the most part but um, I have canoed down um, the Dermascata uh, between the two middens and it really is a spectacular um, site it, even now in their very different forms to travel down the river between the whaleback and the Glen bins these big bold white hills um left by people living and eating and um and uh you know and enjoying this place like we do so so bonnie mentioned also that we have um participated now in this program called the Maine Midden Minders. This is uh, an uh, undertaking by Dr. Alice Kelly, um, who invited us to participate. And so she has trained us to, um, to monitor the middens. And so we have teams of volunteers who go out and take measurements of the middens that are under assault at this point because of changing climate, and conditions in Maine, um, these freeze thaw conditions and heavy storm surges and rising sea level. Uh, we are certainly losing our middens, unfortunately. And so perhaps many of you who have traveled the coast um, on your own travels have witnessed this, but if you if you visit a site over and over again, um, just, just visually, you can very likely see changes of, of of loss along the shore. And that's certainly the case in um, with respect to the middens, many of them at least. Um, so happily, we are working to at least be able to monitor, understand what's happening, how fast we're losing, um, what the changes look like. Um, and in some cases, folks have recovered um, 
tools and other artifacts that are certainly of interest and um, uh, they pr provide a lot of information potentially to, to us and, and to the tribes and to anyone who's, who's interested in learning more about the cultures of, this, um, of the indigenous people here. So um, you too could get involved and there are, um, I encourage you to check out this website, learn more about Mid and Minding. If you'd like to reach out to me or very likely to Bonnie as well. Um, to learn about what's going on in your area with respect to monitoring. Um, that is certainly welcome. So here's um, Dr. Alice Kelly training some volunteer, well, in this case, talking to some volunteers along the shore, but um, certainly uh, the bank behind them is the kind of bank that uh, we often see small middens in, in our area. So there'll be a cutaway um, because of changing shore conditions and the roots are exposed and we find shell heaps um, beneath those roots and so forth. And so the volunteers will, will have an opportunity to monitor them over time. So I am going to stop there and happy to um, turn it over to Carrie Ann and see where what kinds of questions and comments folks have. Sure. Um, so now is the time, folks, um, that we were, we've just heard a bunch of amazing information. I know I learned so much. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself. Um, if you would prefer to enter it into the chat, um, I can keep track of that as well. Um, and I've got some questions too, um, but if anyone as a question, go ahead and, and unmute and um, go for it. Um, I would love to, um, I, I teach a marine biology class and I'm really fortunate because I um, am afforded a vehicle, a, a little bus that I take. I have 14 students and we can go visit. And I'm in, I'm in the Machias area, East Machias area. Um, and I would love to incorporate all of this information into that class. Um, are there resources and links and people I can reach out to? Um, certainly, uh, I'm, I'm available if you want to uh, talk with me about how to um, integrate some of this information into your curriculum. Um, we, uh, we don't have a formal uh, shell heap curriculum, but I will say that uh, the Maine State Museum has a really nice curriculum unit on uh, Malaga Island, which is, um, Malaga Island was a mixed race um, ethnicity uh, location where people um, after European contact settled and um, uh, collected shellfish. And there are actually shell heaps there that uh, those folks collected. And that's a really wonderful curriculum unit to, to start with, I would think. Um, we are we're trying to work on, you know, getting more curriculum because we have a lot of requests for information on uh, indigenous uh, shell heaps. And, um, you know, I would say stay tuned <laughs> um, and certainly send, you know, reach out to the Midden Minders and we will keep you informed of anything that we have that is coming, um, coming out that might help you in your classes. Now, um, and I apologize for coming in late. I was actually on with a UMO cooperative extension, um, mm -hmm. Maine Gardeners that okay. went. <laughs> but um, any anything down in the Down East area? Um, I love Damers. It's a beautiful area. Um, I'm adding that to my list to go visit. But um, for the whale back, but anything down this way? So we we just finished a field school uh, at um, in Machias Port and. Typically, we don't uh, make those super public in, in part because um, we don't want to draw folks to the shell heaps um, who, who may you know, be looking to collect artifacts. Um, but we do have a really nice uh, relationship with the Passamaquoddy community, and um, we've done a lot of work uh, in Machias Port over the years. And so one of the folks down at uh, UMaine Machias that you might reach out to is Bernie Vinzani, who, do you know Bernie? 
Yeah. Um, so he's worked with uh, the Passamaquoddies on the petroglyph uh, site that is near shell heaps, as well as he's done some of his own kind of uh, work with the shell heaps as well in terms of art. So um, I would suggest perhaps start there or start with Yume Machias. And I think they may even have an exhibit on the shell heaps down there. So. I think I did a paper making workshop with Bernie at one yeah. point. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll write his, yeah, thank you. Okay, we have another question in the chat here from Julie in, um, Bar Harbor. Um, she wants to know if there's a map of known middens in Maine, or is this sensitive info to share due to worries of potential vandalism? Um, they have one at Hadley Point on MDI and would love to know more about it. Um, and should she reach out to Acadia National Park? So we don't typically advertise where uh, shell heaps are in in an effort to protect them. Um, you know, one of the things that I learned several years ago was that um, unsavory characters, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, will go to these locations and collect the um, indigenous artifacts in, in the material culture and um, sell it in exchange for drugs and other things. And so we, uh, generally do not advertise where they are, or certainly we don't create maps. Um, a lot of times local communities, um, you know, people within the communities know where a lot of these are anyway. Um, and I guess, you know, if you're interested in visiting, I would suggest, you know, the more public ones such as um, the Damariscotta Middens might be a, a good spot to, to visit. And, um, but yeah, we, we tend not to map these locations for obvious reasons. Great. Um, she says, thanks. <laughs> um, does anyone else have a question? Um, I know that, that I do. Um, Bonnie, you mentioned that um, there were some of the middens or heaps that um, also involved non-Indigenous um, people. And I was just curious as to, um, I guess, how you knew that and then um, what they were, if they were using it for the same reason or different reasons, or if you could elaborate on that. Yep. Um, well, I mentioned Malaga Island. That was one um, location where, uh, um, uh, you know, is kind of a non-Indigenous or post-colonial. Right. Mm -hmm. um, place. But another area, again, I go back to Machias Bay. Um, we are, we're, the site that we worked on this year has both uh, European and Indigenous, um, has both European and Indigenous material culture there. And we know that because we have fragments of pottery from uh, France, St. Ange pots. Um, and we also have an English chamber pot. Um, there's evidence of um, uh, Jesuit uh, use of that location as well. And so, but we also have in, in indigenous um, material culture as well. So the, the challenge is always um, trying to determine is it indigenous peoples using European materials or is it European material oh, right. people using indigenous material or excuse me European materials so it's um it's a bit of a challenge but I think based on what we're seeing in Machias Bay is that it's a, a place of contact and and people are <clears throat> um interacting there now whether or not it was land encroachment or if it was shared space that we haven't been able to figure out. Um, and so there are a number of shell heaps that do have that kind of um, uh, representation of, you know, kind of non-Indigenous folks. And so um, they're not as common as, you know, the others, but uh, they do exist. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Um, I actually have another question. Um, I was wondering if there's any evidence of Native Americans um, farming um, the shellfish like like we do today, or were they just so plentiful? Um, uh, so that's a million dollar question right there. <laughs> um, in um, 
I don't know, you know, I guess it depends on how you define farming. Um, I, you know, I certainly think that they were, um, they may have been nurturing these locations and I don't know how they were doing that. I do know that um, uh, a French settler uh, by the name of Nicholas Dennis made note of um, Mi'kmaq people har uh, harvesting shellfish in the winter and they actually had tongs and um, they would cut a hole in the ice and use tongs to pull uh, oysters out. Wow. And, um, and so, you know, I don't know if that's, um, you know, I don't know if the connection between tools and, and shellfish and um, would signify some sort of farming, but I, I just don't think we have enough information to address that. Sure, sure. Did yeah. I answer all of your question? You did, you did. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we've got something else coming in on the chat here from Carol. Um, they would like to know if a person knows where a midden is, but it is on someone else's private property, is there some way to get that property owner to allow the scientific community to come and examine that place? Are there any laws that protect these on private property if the owners don't necessarily care or want to do anything about it? Um, so Sarah, do you want to take that or, or you want me to? Uh, yeah, I, I certainly can speak to okay. it. I, there's, um, uh, and Bonnie, you certainly can chime in. So it, it is private property, like you're saying. And so no, there, you know, to my knowledge, there are not laws. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Bonnie. Um, and so we are really are at the, um, at the whim, I guess, of, of the private landowners. I will say that in my, um, albeit limited experience in reaching out to people, they're very interested is a general rule. And the folks that I have spoken to, while they might have concerns about what activities an archeologist or a historian might, and, you know, what it might look like to have volunteers come out and monitor the midden, um, by and large people are really enthralled um, to know that their property can offer something to all of humanity uh, with respect to, to learning about indigenous people here and, and, um, and the place that they live in. So my, my personal experience fortunately has been really positive, but I don't know if you wanna add anything to that, Bonnie. Yeah, uh, my experience has been um, positive as well. Uh, one of the things uh, to know about shell heaps and private land ownership is they own those shell heaps and they own the materials as well. So they're under no obligation to really turn those materials over to any institution or to the tribes or anything. It's uh, very much a private property um, ownership issue, which um, I, you know, I always try and encourage landowners to consider donating their collections either to, you know, university or better yet, the tribal museums, and there are tribal museums within all of the four Wabanaki communities. Um, and so trying to uh, encourage people to um, acknowledge whose heritage, you know, they um, are, uh, whose heritage exists on their property, you know, that's something that I try to do. There are trespassing laws. So for example, if, um, you know, some somebody is trying to collect or loot from a site, um, the landowner can, uh, you know, protect it through trespassing laws, but that's about it. This is a little bit, um, it, it, my mind goes to, um, as I was looking at the middens, um, how huge they are. Um, have you ever been to North Haven to see um, Adam Campbell's oyster farm there? Mm -mm. It's on Middle River and it's um, it's mind blowing. Actually, Gordon Ramsay just went out to visit and it's <laughs> because it's an island 12 miles out. I used to live on North Haven. So because it's 12 miles out, um, they started an oyster farm out there and it is like oysters as far as you can see. I mean, you just go out and you can just scoop up baskets and where they've gone downstream, they're huge. And it it kind of, as I saw that, I'm like, oh, that's feasible because I've seen this oyster farm that has absolutely no traps or barriers of any kind. It's just open. Um, mm -hmm. 
it, it just kind of connected it to me like it it makes me feel like that is possible to create a heap years and years and years in the making yes and i've been to north haven um but not for that reason you know north haven is archaeologically rich um and some of the most um sacred and oldest sites shell heap sites are there as well um but next time i'm gonna have to check out the oyster farm because i didn't do that when i was there yeah yeah i mean i i would love to go out and play a drone over it and it it would for me it just connects the possibility of these mints and be able to share food and plentiful if you know what i mean and it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a resource that just keeps producing more yep. yeah um, we had another question come into the chat. Um, so with regard to conservation and sea level rise, are all of the sites threatened or are some sites set back enough to be safe? Um, what, what has been done and what can be done to protect vulnerable sites for, um, for example, coffer dams? <clears throat> you want me to take that, Sarah? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Um, you're familiar with more sites than I am, so. <laughs> so, unfortunately, we are um, in a position where we can't, um, we, if, if we put any kind of riprap or anything um, to protect um, a shell heat from eroding, it just kind of deep moves that energy to another place. And so we found that um, any kind of um, stabilization of these banks uh, will result in damage other, in other places. Um, I think in terms of conservation, our, the Midminders program, one of the things that we do is, um, is to try and uh, monitor sites get a handle on how fast they are eroding. And we do know that not all of them are eroding at the same rate. Uh, the site uh, that I work on in Machias Bay, uh, the landowner said they've lost about, um, uh, I think it's 40 feet in the last 30 years. So that's a pretty significant loss of that um, location. And so one of the things that we hope to do with um, <clears throat> the information we gather through midden minders is to prioritize those places that are most vulnerable. And, um, and then we can come up with some stewardship and management strategies for um, either salvaging <clears throat> some of the material culture or coming up with some other form of um, uh, preservation. And so, yeah, it, it's a dilemma, and uh, I don't have good answers to that other than, you know, saying the first step is knowing which ones are being most threatened and which ones uh, should be priority in terms of research. And I think that's a conversation that we need to have um, with the uh, Wabanaki communities. All right. Thank you. Um, and I think we are about out of time. Um, so I have added um, a link in the chat. Um, if anyone, um, if you enjoyed tonight's program um, and would like to help support further programs like this in the future, um, you can click that link and donate. Um, you can also always um, visit herringut.org. Um, and you can find the link there as well, um, as well as a bunch of our um, summer schedules and summer programs that are going on. Um, I really want to thank so much our speakers, Bonnie and Sarah. I learned so much. We had lots of questions. Um, so thank you so much for really this, this great evening presentation. Um, and thank you everyone else for, for joining us and, and sharing an interest um, in, in really learning about our Native American culture and, and how to preserve it and how to, how to learn more. Um, really great way to connect. Um, so you can all look for a recording um, for tonight's event in your email. Um, it usually will go out um, the next day. So you should see that tomorrow. Um, you're welcome to share this. You're welcome to rewatch it. Um, and please be on the lookout for further um, virtual virtual programs from Hearing Gut.
Coastal Science Center. So thank you um, and have a lovely rest of your evening. Bye. <clears throat> thank you. Best wishes. Thank you.